I'm glad you're here. Can't think of anybody, anywhere else I'd rather be than right here. No other people that I'd rather be with than you. And uh, I just want to take just a second, because I don't get to have them here often, but these wonderful looking people up here are my sister and brother-in-law and mom and dad. They're here just for the morning uh, for my nephew who graduated yesterday from Trebekah. I'm glad. I'm especially glad you guys are here. And then the Tuckers are here from Hendersonville. They were in my preaching class here just a few weeks ago, and we're glad to have them here with us as well. In fact, would you just turn to your neighbor right now and say, I'm glad to have you here today. And if you don't have a neighbor, I'm glad, I'm glad to have you here today. We are finishing up uh, a series on Revelation. And this morning finds us in chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open them with me. Revelation 21. We're going to read verse 10 and then skip down and read 22 through the end of the chapter. And I would, once you found your spot, invite you to stand in honor of the reading of the word. If you don't have your Bibles, the words will be on one of three screens is working today, which I knew when I got up this morning, I, I was, had this great feeling about what God was going to do. And then uh, within like an hour, Brandon, uh, he comes downstairs and said, uh, Jake's got strep throat. He's a normal drummer. And Joe just stepped in this morning, did a great job. We get here and getting everything ready to go like every normal Sunday, turn stuff on. And we turn it on, it starts coming off. And uh, so I don't know if any of the, the lights may go out. If they do, just stay, remain calm, <laughs> stay seated. And we're going we're gonna to hear what God God has to say to us today. Hear the word of the Lord. Revelation 21, beginning with verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor Will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I'm guessing that if I pulled everybody in here and most people that are out there and said the, asked the question, where do you want to live for eternity? What would you all say? Heaven, exactly right. Great answer. I was hoping you'd say that. It just makes sense. I mean, after all, who wouldn't want to live in a place with pearly gates and golden streets and no more night, a place where there's no more suffering or sickness or heartache or separation. There's no more depression or divorce or devastation or destruction. There's no more death. There's no more night. There's no more worry or fear or financial pressures or, or pink slips at the job. There's no more mortgages. There's no more bills coming in the mail. Who wouldn't want to live in a place like that? I'd want to live in a place like that. But if we're going to be honest, and I try to be honest, if we're going to be honest, the, the, the most accurate thing that I think I could say to some people is not, don't you want to go to heaven? I think the most accurate thing I could say is, eh, you probably wouldn't like it there. Now, doesn't that sound strange? I mean, who would, who would not want to be in a place like that? Well, according to Revelation 21, I think John, if he were among us this morning, he would say, well, I think there probably are a lot of people who would say, ah, I'm not so sure I would like it there. We may not say it, you know, like that, but we say it. First group of people, verse 22, who wouldn't like it? They're the temple-centric people. Whose entire, by, here's what I mean by that, temple-centric, or we could say church-centered folk. Whose primary concept of the Christian faith all revolves around a building or an address. In this case, 3135 Trenton Road. The people who have a mindset who, that revolves around this. Probably not going to be very happy. In heaven. Now, I've been in ministry a little over 20 years now, and uh, over the course of that time, have come across 
A few people, and I'm not being facetious and I'm not being sarcastic at all. A few people whose, whose faith was not Christocentric. It was not Christ-centered. It was church-centered faith. Several different qualities and characteristics about folks like that. They tend to be more concerned about what happens inside the building than the lost and dying people who are outside the building. They tend to be more concerned about the paint on the walls instead of the gossip that sometimes happens in the halls. Christ-centered people are different than church-centered people. It's temple-centric. Those are the folks that tend to be more concerned with position and posture and what's proper in the building. Temple-centric people. They, um, they're not going to be very happy in heaven. You know the reason why they're not going to be happy in heaven? Come on, talk to you. Why would a temple-centric person not be happy in heaven? Not going to be any temple. That's right. So if your whole worldview, your whole approach to the Christian faith is like, you know, the more you come to the temple, uh, here, here's another kind of characteristic or quality of a temple-centric person. They equate time in the temple with spiritual maturity. So more time in the temple, more spiritual maturity. As if coming to the building somehow injects some level of growth that just automatically happens because you're in the house. Temple-centric faith. The reason that temple-centric Christians are not going to be very happy in heaven is because there is no temple there. The holy city, as John calls it, the new Jerusalem, doesn't need a temple because he is the temple. And Jesus is going to be front and center, the middle of everything. So here's the truth. If our life doesn't have Jesus front and center, the middle of everything, with a life that is centered around, consumed with Christ, if it's not like that now, we'd probably not be very happy when it's like that then. Now, I got a confession. Can you know the confession good for the soul, right? I have been a temple centric Christian before. You know how I know that? Yeah, I'm gonna give you a litmus test and we're gonna see how many the rest of you are too, but don't you know, don't raise your hands or anything. How many of you find it easier to talk about the church than to talk about the Christ? If you find it easier to talk about the church than to talk about the Christ, you may just be a temple-centric Christian. One of the reasons that that's important for us today, I think, is because I, I'm not a doomsday person. Anybody been around me for five minutes? No, I'm, you know, I'm the, I'm the half-full person. I'm not doom and gloom and it's all going bad. But, you know, we, one of the things we've seen in Revelation is that John totally anticipates it's going to get worse before it gets better, right? <clears throat> Comes through loud and clear. I'm concerned about temple-centric believers because if the temple falls, their faith falls as well. And what would happen to us if an act of God, well, I don't know why they call it an act of God, you know, tornado, all the bad stuff, they say that's an act of God, tornado, hurricane, whatever. If, you know, Mother Nature got upset and a tornado came through and the church was gone tomorrow, or worse yet, what would happen if during our lifetime, the government that has been pretty conducive to Christianity decided no more churches? If we had a temple-centric faith, a lot of people would be hurting. We're not trying to build a temple-centric faith. We're trying to build a Christ-centered way of life. Because you know what happens then? If it, this place could get blown away, it could burn up, it could be gone. And my faith and your faith would not have to be shaken if it's built on a foundation that's something bigger than 3135 Trenton Road. A Christ-centered life now will make for a very happy Christ-centered holy city then. 
Now, I, I need to backpedal just a tad and say the church is important. This building is important. And on a work day, I want a whole lot of people to think it's important. Hebrews 10. Lisa, Hebrews 10, 25. I think it's verse 20. Yeah, 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This place is important. As believers in Jesus, we have to be gathering together. This is where the body is built up. This is where the army gets trained. This is where the saints get equipped. We can't be Christian without without relationship with each other. There's just no other other way to do that. In fact, some of us could, could stand to make the church a lot bigger priority than it is now. Because it's hit or miss. It's if this isn't happening or if that's not happening or, you know, if it rains, I'll come. But if it's not raining, you know, fishing's calling me and, or, or this or that or whatever else. I, you know, we, honestly, there are a lot of folks that are here right now, and I'm glad you're here. I don't want to offend you, but I'm just going to tell you the truth. If the church is a get-to-whenever-you-feel-like-it kind of place, that, that needs to change. Thank you, Pastor H. He's here all the time. He can say that. Amen. That's right. Preach it, brother. (laughs) That's the first group. Verse 22, temple-centric faith. I mean, I can say to folks, you know, heaven's a wonderful place, but if he's not the center of your life now, probably not going to like it. Then there's the other extreme, the uh, nature-centric faith. You You know those kind, right? I love to worship God in nature. In fact, I commune with him. I don't even need the church because it's, you know, it's out in the boat or on the golf course or with a fishing pole in my hand or uh, in a tree stand. That's where I really connect with God. Yes. I wish he had, he must have had to step out of here, but you can convey this story to him. Pastor Houston, a couple weeks ago, he and I went fishing. He's a great fisherman, by the way. And it was one of those perfect days. No wind, the sky was blue, the conditions were just right, except for the fish weren't biting all that great. I don't know what was up with that, but we had a great time being out there. So we're out there. We caught a few crappie, and he caught a catfish. We caught some bluegill. But um, we're having this conversation, and first of all, let me say, no names were you, so I don't even know who he was talking about. So if this was you, he didn't rat you out. He just kind of conveyed the story. He's greeting, right, on Sunday morning, and he's, isn't he like the greatest greeter ever? And for those of you who are new, you don't know that, he pastored this place for 13 years, and now he's retired and he's back and he remembers names better than I do. He's awesome to have around. But uh, he's greeting people, and somebody comes in that he hadn't seen for a few weeks. He said, I've been missing you. And their response was, I've been worshiping God in nature. And in a way that only Pastor Houston could get away with, he said, no, you haven't. And if I'd have said that, I'd have, you know, my nose would have been bloody. But he says it. And the person pauses and they looked at him and said, you're right. Some of the greatest encounters that I've had with God have been in nature. The breathtaking sunrise over the Atlantic from the beach. Sitting in a tree stand before daylight when nature begins to wake up and the birds start singing their song of praise and I get the chance to join in with them in that. God has met me in places like that. But too often what happens with the folks who say, you know, I'm a nature-centric kind of Christian, we begin to focus on the created and somehow in the midst of all that, the creator gets lost. Not that we can't ever do that, but verse 23 it kind of, you know, it, it makes me want to say to folks who are nat- nat- nature-centric that, you're, you know, heaven's a great place. No, no suffering, sigh- sighing, sickness, pain, death, just all that. But, you know, you're probably not going to like it there. You know why? Verse 1, there is no sea. Verse 23, there is no sun. There is no moon. There is no need for any other light because he is the light. Everything about heaven will have Jesus at the center of it all. And if Jesus is not the center of life now, probably not going to be very happy with it when he is then. 
There's temple-centric. There's nature-centric. There's also egocentric. Egocentric Christians who say it's all about me and it's all about the people who are like me. So if you're not like me, we probably aren't going to get along very well down here. I just assume you go to your block and I'll stay on mine. But if we're different, we can't really be together. Got news for you. If heaven is anything, it is a diverse place. We saw it a couple weeks ago. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be there. Verses 23 to 26 in chapter 21 right here. If you've got your Bibles, take a look at it. The kings of the nations will bow before him. People from every place will bring before the Lord their gifts, their offering, their praise, their worship. And I want to tell you today, there will be people there who are not like you. Thank God there will be people there who are not like me. If, if our approach to the Christian faith is all about me and the people who are like me, I'm telling you, when we get to heaven, it ain't, we're not going to, I mean, you probably wouldn't like it there. Because you know what it's going to be like there? Jesus is going to be at the center of everything. He will be the one who is exalted. And all eyes will be on him and not on each other. And people that are like you and people who are not like you who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb will be in a posture of praise and worship from now till who knows when. And it will all be about Jesus. Here's the truth. If it's not all about Jesus for you now, probably not going to like it. Because it's going to all be about Jesus then. Now, at this point, I'm thinking, that's pretty good stuff. Because I don't feel like a whole lot of it's hitting me too bad right now. In fact, for the most of us, we're probably sitting here thinking, I can get with that. If that's the way heaven's going to be, I, don't, I haven't heard anything yet that kind of knocks me out of that. You're not going to like it there kind of conversation. So I'm good to go. Let's, all right, let's wrap it up. Have a song. Do the benediction. Send us out. Woo, and heaven going to be wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Don't forget the offering. Thank you, David. <laughs> but he's got to go and add verse 27. He just can't leave well enough alone when it affects what bothers everybody else without what might bother us. Because here's what verse 27 says, the Steve paraphrase version. If you are not holy now, you will not be happy then. Not only is there not going to be any sun, moon, stars, no temple. Nothing impure will enter it. Nothing impure will enter it. Nothing impure. No deceit. No shame. No falsehood. No lies, no secret sins, no hidden habits. Nothing impure will enter there. Nothing. If you are not holy now, you won't be happy then. Because this is a holy city with a holy God. And a holy people whose robes have been made pure by the blood of the Lamb. With holy angels singing a holy song. It is a holy place. And if we're not a holy people, we're not going to like it very much. Hebrews chapter 12. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. This is where it's at. Without holiness, no one. We'll see God. So, man, that's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? So how do we, how do we approach that even? How do we even talk about that? How, how, how on earth could we describe our own selves as holy people? Well, I want you to know that right from the very beginning, that's always been God's intent. It's always been his desire. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. This is what it says. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So what does that mean? And how do we get there? Well, let me tell you how we don't. We don't arrive at 
destination holy by just trying to be good people. You can't do your way into holy. You can't do your way into holy any more than you can do your way into being saved. It's a gift from God. It's the work of God in us, not anything we do in and for ourselves. If it was up to us to be holy and the only resource we had to draw on was us, we'd all be in trouble. It doesn't happen because we wish it, will it, want it, or work it. It happens because God wishes, wants it, wills it, and works it in us. You know what holiness is? Christ in us. The hope of glory. Holiness is a pure God coming to dwell in an impure vessel and transforming it from the inside out. Holiness is a loving God moving into a hateful heart and radically rearranging it by the power of his presence. Holiness is, is us being restored into the image of this perfect God who created us in, to bear his image that got marred and scarred in the fall all the way back in Genesis. Holiness is God's restoring, redeeming work of making us what he intended us to be from the very beginning. Holiness. Holiness is Christ in us. Holiness is a life totally centered in, saturated by, and consumed with Jesus. Holiness is integrity. Holiness is transparency. Holiness is us living a life just as faithful to one another and to God as God lives to us. Holiness is not what we work in ourselves. Holiness is what only God could work in us. And here's the truth. If we're not holy now, we ain't going to be happy then. Man, he could have gone all day without listening to that verse 27. Wow. He just couldn't leave well enough alone. It's a sobering word to the church to say that without holiness, no one will see God. It's a word of great news for the church to say, without holiness, no one will see God. Because here's the good news. The God who commands it and demands it is the God who provides it. The God who says you can't get there without it says, I want to give it to you. And this is what he gives us. He gives us himself. So that all of our life gets consumed with him. I think this picture that John paints for us in Revelation 21 of this holy city, this Christocentric place, it's not just to say, look at what it's going to be later on. It's to say, this is the kind of life you're called to be living now. You want to get ready for the trip? <laughs> Live a holy life that is Christ-consumed, Christ-saturated, Christ-centered. That's what Christianity is anyway. You're not going to arrive by coming to the temple more often. You're not going to get that holiness worked into you out in a tree stand or in a boat somewhere. You're not going to experience the cleansing work of God's Holy Spirit just by hanging out with other people who are like you. It's not a, it's not a temple-centric, nature-centric, or ego-centric thing. It is a Christ-centered encounter where he consumes us with himself. And my question for you this morning is, if that, I, I, I mean, I think, I'm, I think I've painted an accurate picture of what it is God is asking for from us. The question is, is that the kind of life you're living right now? Consumed, centered, saturated. Not with church. Not with the beauty of the creation. I mean, I mean, honestly, in your heart of hearts, is it really all about Jesus? There have been times where if I was sitting right where you're sitting right now, I would have to say, no, it's not. 
And if that's you this morning, no, it's not all about Jesus. He's not consuming me. He's an add-on. He's a convenience. He's, a, he's an insurance policy. But he's not everything. I'm asking you today, if he's not everything, let him become everything. And as Brandon sings, if you need to pray about that and say, God, consume me, here I am. Our altar is open. We encourage people to use it. And uh, I invite you to respond however it is the Lord would have you to respond. Ooh.